So it's a great pleasure to have Johanna Yerdeninger uh, here. Well then, Joe. Sorry? Um, to um, give today's uh, seminar. She's joining us from Germany. So uh, she tells me that she was a student of Hugh Osborne, which I hadn't, didn't know. So there's, uh, Hugh has a connection with the Institute as well over the years. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, so thank you for joining us. Even, yes. uh, and hopefully we will have you in, here in person before too long. Uh, yes, thank you very much. So I'll thank you. I'll over the floor to you. Yes, thank you very much. I'm very happy in, that you invited me to your seminar, and um, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, discussions as well. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. So um, actually, I, I um, so my main area of research is uh, the ads cft correspondence and its uh, generalizations and also various applications of it. And uh, so today I was, I'm planning to talk about actually two somewhat distinct topics, uh, one of which is slightly more on the mathematical side, which is about this modular flow. Actually, can you see when I use my mouse? Yes. Okay, so, so the, the, the more mathematical part will be about the modular flow, and the second part will be more condensed matter physics oriented uh, towards new DR materials. And um, so, uh, essentially, my talk is based on two recent papers, so and they are not related to each other, <laughs> um, except by the fact that they are both connected to the ADS-CFT correspondence law in slightly different ways. So the first one is some, some more formal considerations in view of a further understanding of the correspondence eventually. And the second one, and this is actually quite interesting because, um, as you probably know, so Würzburg is a place with, that is uh, very strong in condensed matter physics. And so um, when I came here four years ago, it was certainly a good idea to team up my colleagues from condensed matter physics, mostly working also on topological insulators and related topics uh, for some joint projects. And uh, so this is now um, one of the first results of this new collaboration between people more from a string theory background like me. <laughs> Uh, working together with some um, true condensed matter physicists, mostly the group of uh, Ronnie Tomale. I think he's quite famous in the condensed matter community. Maybe you've heard of him. And uh, so this is uh, actually, I'm very proud of the fact that we managed to paper, publish a paper on nature communications, which certainly for a string theorist is not something that happens frequently. And uh, so that was a really um, impressive demonstration that actually people from very different backgrounds can work together in a nice fashion. But okay, this will be my, the second part of my talk. And now the first part, uh, I'm going to focus on this paper. So which was written actually, so with Pascal Fries, who is a PhD student of my colleague, Haya Hinrichsen, who is a statistician, who is also at our chair. Uh, Ignacio Reyes, who's from Chile and is now a postdoc in Potsdam uh, with Michael Heller actually. And uh, so he used to be my PhD student, but now moved on to be a postdoc. And Christian Simon uh, was my master student, but he just now decided not to do a PhD, but to actually um, become a, a school teacher. And uh, I should say that uh, Pascal and Ignacio, um, they did a terrific job as teaming up beforehand uh, on a kind of similar topic uh, on which, to which this uh, paper on to this is an, an addition. And uh, uh, they actually managed to jointly write a paper in PIL, which I think for a postdoc and student is uh, quite an achievement. And then the history of this paper I'm going to talk about now is that uh, it's uh, with my student, my master student Christian, who was looking for uh, a topic. And then we all decided to team up to, to uh, work on what I'm going to explain to you now. So just to give you a little bit of the history of this paper. Okay, <clears throat> so um, I'm going to start by explaining what a modular Hamiltonian and a modular flow is. But uh, so I guess in, in your audience, um, many people will know what this is, but let me very briefly say um, from the beginning what, what I mean by this. So, um, so the starting point is to look at a state given by some density matrix rule. And um, then what we're going to consider is uh, entanglement. So probably as you know, entanglement is a very important uh, concept in, in the ADS-CFT correspondence. And, and there's this famous result by Rio and Takayanagi where they 
map uh, entanglement in a quantum field theory uh, to a geometric object in anti-visitor space. So there's this now, I know, um, very important and very fruitful question, how to map entanglement to geometric objects in, in the context of ADS-CFT. And uh, so uh, there, what people generally uh, use, consider as the entanglement entropy. And uh, so this means you choose a space time, uh, space region called V. <coughs> and uh, then you consider the reduced density matrix uh, for the states in this region V, which is called rho V. And um, then the standard en uh, entropy of thermodynamics generalizes to the so-called entanglement entropy, which is given here. So uh, where instead of just the standard probability, you have um, this reduced density matrix. And so this provides information about the entanglement between this region, the states in this region and its complement. Okay, and then now in a somewhat of fashion, um, the, the standard Hamiltonian of quantum mechanics uh, generalizes to the so-called modular Hamiltonian, K. And uh, this is uh, an operator which is defined implicitly via this equation here, <coughs> where we just start from this reduced density matrix and, and then uh, write this uh, in this standard fashion and this in this way implicitly define this uh, operator KV. So this means that we will consider a generalized time evolution so the normal Hamiltonian is, uh, gives you the evolution of the time in your space time. And here this modular Hamiltonian um, will give us some kind of generalized evolution along a generalized time coordinate. And I should say that this concept has been around for uh, quite some time and it has many, um, so the spectrum of this operator, which is often referred to as entanglement spectrum, has many applications throughout physics and many body physics and quantum field theory. So it has been used to characterize topological order. Then there's this, it's related to this important concept of the so-called relative entropy. And in the context of the ADS-CFT correspondence, um, it is an essential idea for gravity bulk reconstruction from the quantum field theory boundary data. And many people has, you have used this in this context. Okay, <clears throat> now the thing is that this modular Hamiltonian, which I just defined for you, is known explicitly on a, only in an extremely small number of cases. Okay. And the, the best known example for which people calculated this modular Hamiltonian um, is for a quantum field theory on Rindler space time. So, and there actually uh, one obtains a universal and also a local result. Okay. So, uh, Rindler space time is an accelerated reference frame in Minkowski space-time. So here's a picture from Wikipedia where you see this Rindler space-time, this uh, wedge. And uh, so here you see lines of constant acceleration. And then um, essentially this modular Hamiltonian tells you uh, about the evolution uh, along these lines of constant acceleration. Now probably you're familiar with the UNRU effect um, where um, an observer experiencing a constant acceleration um, uh, can interpret this as being in a heat bath as a temperature. And this is uh, very much related to now to the fact that you, it is actually possible to evaluate this modular Hamiltonian explicitly in this context. And this leads to the so-called bisognano wichmann theorem. So these are two important uh, people in uh, algebraic quantum field theory. And so this theorem is already from 1976, so some time ago. And uh, um, okay, so there's some need for regularization. So we need to subtract the, the modular Hamiltonian of the vacuum, but we get this local expression. Um, Can I ask a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. This is not the modular Hamiltonian of Tomita Takesaki. Oh, yes, yes, yes exactly. So, um, the word, so yes, exactly. So Can I finish the question? This uh, Tomita operated delta has yeah. no, it's not trace class. Is, uh, its uh, spectrum is not bounded either below or above. But here you are writing trace of exponential minus kv that will diverge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you are absolutely right. <laughs> okay. I just was trying to give some motivation. Okay. So, so um, and for this diverge, so, yeah. Okay. The, this term is here for regularization purposes. Okay. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, this, this term will diverge, but uh, it, 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 it can be regularized and this is what's happening here. Yeah. 
I will come back to the uh, to Mita Takezaki theory in, in just three slides. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, apart from this very simple example, there are some further examples um, like uh, the CFT vacuum on a ball, uh, the two dimensional CFTs for a single uh, interval uh, on a, in the vacuum on a cylinder, or uh, the thermal state on a real line. So I think, and that's all the examples where this modular Hamiltonian is actually known explicitly and uh, where it also leads to a, a local result. Okay. And um, so before I come to this Tomita Takizaki, which theory which was already mentioned, uh, let me say that um, um, you can this, you can view this modular Hamiltonian as a generator uh, of some flow, <coughs> and this flow is then called the modular flow. And then, so the modular flow essentially means that uh, we consider a generalized time evolution with the density matrix. Uh, as you can see, so so sigma t uh, of for some particular operator is the so, is the, so this is the modular flow which depends on time, or some generalized time. And uh, so here we see this um, evolution with the density matrix itself. Okay, so as I already mentioned, in general, uh, this will actually lead to some non-local expression, which means that operators at different positions in space-time will be mixed with each other. <laughs> and of course, again, I'm a bit confused because in the algebraic quantum field theory, yeah. the modular uh, flow is an uh, automorphism of the algebra of observable of local observables. So it preserves locality, but you are saying it not does not preserve may not preserve locality. Yeah, exactly. That that's essentially the main message of my my talk. So is, is I'm very happy that you asked this. So um, maybe let me go through what I was going to say, and then where we, we will exactly see where these non localities appear. Okay, very good point. I mean, this is exactly what I would like to discuss. Um, that um, there is actually quite a few examples where this um, this can be non local and the 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 purpose of this paper I'm talking about is to characterize the degree of non-locality. So this is precisely the point. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so, um, so just to summarize the result of this paper, which I mentioned at the beginning. So there we looked at a number of uh, disjoint intervals, so we can have a large number of, of these intervals. So this is then our entangling region V. I mean, for the simplest cases, we just have such one such interval. And um, so um, the key point is that we can actually express the modular flow in terms uh, of the so-called reduced propagator, which is the, the Green's function um, um, restricted to, um, to this uh, space-time region B. Okay. And uh, so um, we have a, so I should say it's for free some fermions. That's why there's a fermion appearing here. Okay. And, and then there's this particular smearing function here, which involves this reduced propagator and then uh, time uh, to the power of it. And uh, okay, so this is exactly the, the result of this paper. And I, I think the next slide should address the question that you asked. Um, so where does this non-locality come from? Okay, so, um, so, and uh, you were just asking absolutely the right question. So um, let me tell you a little bit about this Tomita Takisaki modular theory. And um, okay, uh, I should reference this paper by uh, Stefan Honans, um, from which we drew uh, many of these facts. And um, okay, so um, as was mentioned before, this is a result from algebraic quantum field theory. And um, uh, so, as you can see here, uh, it, it relies on an operator which is called the two-meter conjugation. And uh, so, it, right, essentially, okay, you start with, with operators in the von Neumann algebra, and uh, so then that act on the Hilbert space, so omega is some state in this, this Hilbert space. And this conjugation operator S is defined in such a way that um, it maps an operator to its uh, Hamiltonian conjugate. And, and so this happens from, for, for an operator in this particular, in, in a chosen von Neumann algebra, which is referred to as R. Okay, so now um, I'm, I'm jumping over many mathematical details, but um, for precise mathematical re reasons, this operator S may be decomposed into a project J times delta to the power half. 
So this is just a convenient way of writing, introducing this uh, aha. So where J is anti-unitary and this delta is positive. I think this is this delta which you were mentioning in your question just uh, five yes. minutes ago. Yeah, yes. very good. Um, okay, so and then um, to meet her proved the theorem that um, if you conjugate this for Neumann algebra, um, it actually uh, gives uh, with this operator J, then it, um, it gets matched to its, its complement, so all the operators that commute with the operators in R. And then we have this uh, operator delta, uh, which maps R to itself in this precise way. And then using these operators, we can write the modular flow in, flow in this particular form. And then um, in this context, the modular Hamiltonian uh, is defined uh, in, in, by this equation here. <clears throat> okay, and um, so now this modular flow um, has to satisfy um, a, a kind of consistency condition, and which is this KMS condition uh, after Kubo, Martin, and, and Schwinger. And uh, so this is this condition is written here. So uh, if, essentially, if we interchange, and then um, to the time we get an, an imaginary, so I is the imaginary unit gets added here. And uh, so this consistency condition has to be obeyed by analogy by, to time evolution at finer temperature. So if we had a Hamiltonian in a system at finer temperature and a time evolution, uh, then this same type of equation would be uh, satisfied. Okay, so this was just a very lightning review of this um, Tomita and Takezaki theory. Okay, um, so uh, given this KMS, condition, um, um, it's actually very natural to define a Green's function associated to these. And um, so for the fermions, this is done in this equation here. Um, so this is the so-called modular two-point function. Uh, again, it's for free fermions. And uh, so there are some certain analyticity properties associated with this KMS condition. Um, which suggests to define a Green's function um, for these two uh, strips in, in, um, in time and so next to each other in the imaginary time. Okay, and then uh, it can actually be shown that if uh, we introduce uh, this function capital sigma t as a test function in this integral here, uh, then just using uh, the properties in that fermions anti-commute uh, for free fermions, uh, we can actually show that this sigma uh, can be written in terms of this uh, modular two-point function uh, subject to choosing uh, the correct um, imaginary, uh, sorry, complex arguments here in the time direction. Okay, and, and so, so this is essentially at the heart of, of what we're going to do, um, what we're going to do next. Okay, so essentially we can write this modular flow in terms of this um, modular two-point function. Okay, so now for the free fermions, um, we can also, given this background from Tomita Takesaki theory, we can use a slightly more quantum field theoretical approach and uh, write our modular Hamiltonian uh, in this following fashion, where this K is now actually uh, a kernel. Um, and uh, so um, by now defining just the ordinary Green's function in this fashion here, so V is this um, entangling region and VC is its complement. Uh, so this, this expression now is completely analogous to what I was talking about before. Um, then um, it can actually be shown. Um, so this actually was studied a long time ago already for, for reduced density matrices. Uh, so here, here are some references. Um, so you can see this more for a while. Um, so actually it has been shown that uh, e to the minus k with k, this um, kernel uh, can be written in, in this way here, uh, where uh, g is the propagated restricted to this particular space-time region v. And uh, okay, so then uh, just inserting this expression, um, we for obtain for a modular flow. Okay, there's a few calculation steps, but just by analogy to due to this um, Tomita Takesaki theory, we then obtain the modular flow um, in this form, uh, where uh, sigma t is given by this expression here. 
Okay, so this was uh, a theoretical derivation. <laughs> but now the point is that um, what we did in this paper to find a particular way to actually uh, evaluate uh, this expression for concrete examples. Okay, so, so again, this is the expression um, that we want to uh, evaluate. And so the idea was to uh, use the, some resolvent technique. Uh, this is here just shown for an arbitrary function f. And uh, so um, we actually just use the spectral decomposition where this is the, uh, the resolvent. And uh, okay, so there's a particular contour that we have to follow. So the spectrum is here given by this um, branch cut from zero to one, and we have to integrate along this like this. So um, this is our definition of the resolvent. And now what we do in, in a number of examples, we use this resolvent to evaluate this expression, which is given here. Okay, uh, just a, a little bit of technical detail. <clears throat> so uh, actually for the well, resolvent, I yeah. I, I missed what was little f in that previous transfer. Oh, it's just some arbitrary, I just wanted to show how to define a resolvent for some okay. arbitrary function. So f is just some arbitrary function. Yeah. Okay, so but once we have- the how, how do you know the, the spectrum is zero to one? Where does that follow from? Uh, good question. Uh, I, I, I think I have to look it up in the paper again. There, there is a particular uh, analyticity region, probably. Because um, here is also one minus g, so apparently it's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I have to check. I mean, okay, maybe I should check. In the, it, it's definitely written in the paper. I mean, there's a, a very. Right. <laughs> I, I don't. I can't tell you off, off head why, why this was. Um, um, yeah, it's, I mean, we have to discuss the analyticity properties of uh, precisely this. And um, uh, okay, I didn't show enough steps to be able to follow it. Sorry. <laughs> um, okay, it's explained in the paper. So um, then we just make a particular ansatz for the resolvent, um, defining. So this is just an ansatz where we don't know what this f of f lambda is. And um, then we ju just use this equation, which um, uh, is unity. And that actually leads to an integral um, equation by which we can determine this um, f lambda. And uh, then um, you know, we insert this into this expression here. And uh, uh, okay, so if we just then formally use this, we get, we get this expression here. Okay. so. Um, no, I, I don't want to go into many more details, so I hope you are interested in, in taking a look. I, I just want to say, so now we evaluated this expression explicitly for a large number of examples. So the first of all, just for um, the free uh, propagator in, 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 in Windler space, and um, so we can confirm that we recover this result for Windler space uh, that I showed you at the very beginning. So that was a kind of test that this approach works. So you want to, can, can you identify what is the key property of the uh, render space that is rendering it local, the uh, modular Hamiltonian local? Okay, so let's go back to that. that that's again excellent question, and um, of course I should know the answer now. But um, uh, okay, so this is probably in this paper from 1976 already. So um, good. Okay, we need to look it up there again, but essentially, okay, you have uh, things moving along these lines. And um, I think it's related to the fact that the constant uh, acceleration leads to this uh, thermal. Um, Can I respond? Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, uh, oh yeah, you're the expert here. <laughs> Not the expert, just. That region is what they call causally convex. Yes. That is, if you take two points in that region, there is a causal line which connects them and it doesn't go out of that region. So it is causally complete, and it is also globally hyperbolic. But the global, the Cauchy surface are given by the taking the boundary and going up, rotating it. Yeah. So it is also globally hyperbolic. So in that case, um, you have the possibility of beginning to define Tomita theory, provided the vacuum is cyclic in separating. But I want to ask a question. The Green's function for this region is not mm -hmm. the standard Green's function. 
sorry. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry because I, I, yeah, I had two, two different Green's functions. Okay, so first we were, um, okay. Uh, um, yeah, first of all, thanks for your explanation. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, this is, um, so th there's this hyperbolic structure and the, the fact it's all causally connected and um, so, so which is probably, in, yeah, as you just said, a key unit for this locality. Um, okay, so now to come to your question. Um, okay, so first we define this um, modular two-point function. Uh, but then I should say that here I move to a slightly different approach where the Green's function is just um, this ordinary. So omega is just some state in the Hilbert space, okay, on which this von Neumann algebra acts. And, um, uh, by the way, Johanna, isn't it the Your sound cut out, Beslan. Yeah, probably. Yeah, that can be. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Very good. But excuse me, one more question, if you don't mind. The, yeah. You are dealing with fermions. They are anti-commuting. Yes. So you have to introduce a twist to make it commuting normally. Otherwise, they, this equation is not. This came as equation is not correct because there are minus signs that come. I mean, here x and y, yeah, some minus signs will start coming in. No? x and y are causally, causally uh, uh, relatively space like, I guess. Okay? Then usual theory it is. Okay? So, the, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, that's not necessary. But they are anti commuting. Okay. Yeah, 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 sure, of course. I mean, I think, I mean, the, this anti, anti, the fact it's anti-commuting is essential for this entire calculation, which we're okay. doing here. I, I, I don't think it works for bosons in a straightforward way. I mean, the fact that there's this anti-commuting property really means that um, you get this relation. So, sorry, where was it? Yeah, yeah, exactly here. I mean, it's really from, from to, to make this identification, it's really absolutely vital that we have an anti-commutator. Yeah. Okay, so um, so um, now yeah, if you so I, I hope I encourage you to look at this paper. <laughs> and so we computed the, this uh, free fermion modular flow now for a, a number of examples. So on the plane, so on the plane we recover exactly this Rindler result um, that we just discussed. Then on the cylinder, both with periodic and anti-periodic boundary conditions, and also on the torus. And then now it comes this essential feature that uh, we discover uh, different uh, properties of um, locality. So um, either the result is non-local and then the kernel, so this capital sigma is a smooth function on all of the region. And then there's two other special, special cases. Okay, so uh, the first case, it can be bi-local. So this means that this uh, kernel is actually proportional to the delta function of uh, some function f. And uh, then obviously there's only contributions if this function has a zero. And uh, so there will be a discrete set of contributions to the sigma and this couples pairs of distinct points. Um, um, since in general, x and y will not be the same um, at your initial starting point t equal to zero. And then the local case is the same as bilocal, but um, there's actually some point in time where x and y coincide. So um, I think this completely non-local structure uh, arises for the cylinder with the periodic boundary conditions. And the torus is an example for this bilocal uh, structure. And uh, so then now if you look at the paper, um, you can see that the locality properties depend on uh, boundary conditions and, and the temperature also. And okay, so so another important uh, point I, I would like to make is that uh, the, the, the this locality directly maps to the structure of the poles and cuts in, in the modular correlator. So so and, and so the modular correlator was this object here, and this one. Okay. So, um, so when this operator has a branch cut, then, um, then we have this non-local situation. And if there's poles, then um, we have those situations. 
Okay, so I, um, it, I'm very impressed to have a, somebody really an expert in Tomita and Takizaki theory <laughs> in the audience. So uh, I guess you know much more about this. <laughs> yeah, but uh, um, so, so I, I already learned quite a lot from your questions. So are there are there other uh, questions about this um, part of the talk? Otherwise, I would now move to the second part. But maybe we should discuss a little more here if you like. So in any case, I encourage you to look at the paper because I mean, it's really nice to, I mean, now it's a really an exercise in complex analysis to evaluate all these terms. And um, so this is really a very interesting result in view of the ADS-CFT correspondence because we really see this uh, map between entanglement and geometry and in more advanced cases than this, just this local, local case. So um, Sorry, but just to, what regions do you restrict to in the plane in the cylinder? I understood it in the plane, your Mr. Rendler wedge, but in the cylinder and torus, what? Well, I mean, okay, so I mean, the, the cylinder, I mean, so, so, so we look at, at selection of intervals, and then when we go to the cylinder, we just compactify um, one direction, and on the torus, we compactify two. Okay. And uh, but that, that that actually changes quite. A, I mean, these these boundary conditions have a very crucial influence on the result. Um, yeah. Um, so coming back to to uh, the question which was asked previously about non-locality, I mean, did I answer? I mean, because you were saying it can only be local, but I think here the essential point was that there's some non-local features. Um, it is not at least to me. It is not clear, but let, I should think. Okay. Where the non-locality? Um, the theorem says that um, if the vacuum, I think omega, I suppose, is a vacuum state or whatever. Okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. But it is to be cyclic in separating. Mm -hmm. Then you have this modular operated delta, mm -hmm. okay? and that delta is I t, which is a unitary operator, which is an outer automorphism of the algebra mm -hmm. of zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. So. Mm -hmm. The region O can be, for example, the causal diamond. Mm -hmm. That's right. yeah. mm -hmm. a standard one. Mm -hmm. Even on a torus, you can define. Um, well, torus cross a line, you can define it. Okay. Um, so it is an automorphism of the algebra. So you never leave the locality region. So I don't quite understand how the non locality is coming. But maybe uh, there is some point. Okay. But the, the Hamiltonian is not the same as the. As the uh... Delta. The evolution. Is a log delta. What she is yes. writing uh, log. So that yeah. operator this is bound. Delta is a positive operator. Okay. Furthermore, right. the point zero mm -hmm. is in the spectrum of delta. Okay. At least in the type three one algebra. Yes. So the log delta has a spectrum from minus infinity to plus infinity, including minus all the way to so it's bounded neither below nor above. So the trace exponential minus kv is not a trace class operator. No. So it was a bit confusing, but she said uh, it was for illustration. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I should say. So this 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 example was just uh, this was just for illustration. So here uh, we do um, do something else. Okay, sorry um, if this was confusing, but uh, uh, certainly uh, it's uh, you know very interesting to hear your comments, and I hope you are motivated to to have a look at our paper <laughs> uh, for the things I couldn't answer right now. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, so maybe for now let me move on to the second part of the talk. Um, sorry, where we will change uh, gears uh, quite a bit. Okay. But um, so I think this is also something rather interesting, which I can show to you. Um, and as I said, the second part of the talk is based on the collaboration between string theorists and condensed matter theorists. And um, I think it's a very nice um, example where people from very different backgrounds can um, join forces in a very productive way. And uh, so the idea was to propose particular new materials in condensed matter physics uh, to test predictions from gauge gravity duality. 
Okay, so, so this is the paper here. Uh, so it's from last year and it has uh, recently appeared in Nature Communications. And, um, and essentially what we do is to uh, propose a so-called uh, Dirac material. So a Dirac material is a material where the band structure is such that um, there are touching points between bands where um, near this uh, Dirac point you really have a a linear dispersion relation, so which looks in a way like a relativistic system. <laughs> and uh, so, and uh, together, my colleagues from Kones Mata, the material which we looked at was the so called scanium hermesmithite. So, let me to tell you a little more about what this material is. Uh, I should say right away, this material doesn't exist yet. <laughs> but uh, so, we are suggesting that, suggesting that maybe it would be worth trying um, to synthesize it. Okay, um, the reason why we are interested in, in this is uh, in view of um, um, enhanced hydrodynamic behavior of electrons. So, I mean, now for already for quite a while now, people are interested to model the electrons in a solid as being um, described as a hydrodynamic fluid. And um, so th this has very, worked very well for many other strongly correlated systems, for instance, for um, um, for the quark gluon plasma in nuclear physics. And then the question is, can we also do something like this for electrons in a solid? But of course, given the fact that there's a lattice and um, you know, there's impurities, there's phonons, um, this is much harder than just having, say, um, a, the quark gluon plasma in an accelerator. And nevertheless, uh, if this is, can be realized, there would be a lot of interesting uh, electronic properties. And in particular, um, probably you're familiar that in, in the ADS-CFT, one of the highlights of applications of the ADS-CFT correspondence is to calculate this ratio of the shear viscosity over the entropy density. And um, so um, this is uh, very small in very strongly coupled systems as described by ADS-CFT. And um, so the idea was to suggest a material uh, where the coupling between effective coupling between electrons is stronger than, even stronger than in graphene, say, such that uh, smaller uh, values of this eta over s can be reached. Oops, sorry, that was the wrong question. Okay, um, okay. so uh, as I just said, when phonon and impurity interactions are suppressed, then electron-electrons may lead, um, interactions may lead to a, a hydrodynamic electron flow. Um, however, there's only a small parameter window in realistic materials because um, yeah, it depends on density, temperature, and so on. And uh, one particular implication that um, this ha uh, has is that um, so this once you have hydrodynamic uh, behavior for electrons, then uh, you, you, uh, you observe a, a decrease of the differential resistance dV by dI, which increase in current I. And um, uh, okay, so um, in at weak coupling, this was already seen a long time ago. So I'm mentioning this because uh, uh, Lawrence Mullenkamp is a, a physicist experimentalist here in the department in Würzburg. So he's uh, very famous for the discovering the spin hole effect in topological insulators. Um, but he has also worked on this um, hydrodynamic behavior. <laughs> And uh, so he was the first to show in an experiment uh, that uh, there's actually high hydrodynamic behavior uh, for electrons in the wire. And this is related to the so-called Gauge effect. So uh, first, um, when increasing, so this is the current and this is the differential resistance. So, and first when increasing the current, we are in the regime of um, ballistic behavior and then the differential resistance grows when the current grows. But then there's a maximum in this curve. And then when we reach the hydrodynamic regime, it will be the other way around. So if we increase the um, current further, then the differential resistance decreases again, which is a sign of this collective behavior in hydrodynamics. And uh, so this is a, a experimental result from uh, for gallium arsenide. Okay, so this is really something which is seen in nature or in these particular materials. 
Um, okay, so essentially um, in this Newton flow, uh, Newton flow regime, you, you, there's um, this ballistic behavior. And so the coherence length of the electrons is much larger um, than uh, the width of this um, wire. And then you have scattering of the walls and so on. So this is this ballistic behavior. And then uh, in this Poisson flow regime where there's hydrodynamic behavior, um, the coherence and the correlation length of the electrons is uh, the shortest length scale. And, um, and then um, so we really have this collective hydrodynamic behavior in, the, in this wire. OK, so um, then what we did uh, quite extensively uh, was to calculate the profiles of um, the velocity in, in these wires, uh, also using ADS-CFT and hydrodynamic techniques. And uh, to see this uh, hydrodynamic behavior, so okay, so this is just a wire, and this is uh, the profile of the velocity of the electrons that move there, just very schematically. And this can only work if the um, typical scale of electron-electron -electron scale uh, scattering is really this, the, the shortest scale in, in your program um, in, in the system. So shorter than impurity scattering, phonon scattering, and the, and the width of the wire. Okay, so um, to increase this hydrodynamic behavior, um, this is essential to, to increase this effective electron-electron coupling strength, uh, which is uh, given here uh, with uh, dielectric constants and the Fermi velocity. And uh, in particular, the electron-electron scattering length uh, goes with one over uh, this alpha effective squared. And this implies that if the electronic coupling is larger, then we will have much more robust hydrodynamic behavior. And so the, the idea is let's uh, find, suggest a material where this uh, alpha effective is, uh, is um, very large. And uh, so that's what we did here. Okay, so the prototype material to which to compare to is graphene. Okay, so graphene is by now the best um, investigated material as far as this hydrodynamic behavior of electrons is uh, concerned. So uh, I'm sure you all are familiar um, what graphene is, and it's also extremely pure. And here, um, so you see that this is a Dirac material, as I explained before, because uh, you know there's these Dirac nodes and in the band spectrum where you have linear behavior here. Okay, so now where's the connection to ADS-CFT? <laughs> well, this is actually comes from um, the fact that we can now use relativistic hydrodynamics to desc describe the flow behavior in this material. And um, so relativistic hydrodynamics means that uh, we um, expand the energy momentum tensor and also conserve currents um, in, um, in derivatives uh, of the four velocity. Okay, so let's assume the system is approximately relativistic, so we can use the four velocity. So you mean this is four velocity. And um, so to zero's order for an ideal fluid, we can organize the energy momentum tensor in this fashion here with the energy density and uh, pressure, the four velocity. This is just a Minkowski metric now. And then to first, so hydrodynamics is an effective fee theory for long wavelengths, small frequency fluctuations. So that's a kind of generalized definition of hydrodynamics. And since the fluctuations are so long wavelengths, uh, we can expand the higher order terms, which um, um, give you the viscosities, for instance, uh, in derivatives. So the, the leading order um, um, correction uh, to this ideal fluid behavior is given by, by this term sigma, which is written here. So P is just some projection operator. And here we have the transversal part, uh, which defines a transport coefficient here, which is the so-called shear viscosity. And then uh, this term with the trace part here, this is the bulk viscosity. Now in anything related to ADS-CFT, uh, mostly we deal with conformal field theories. So then uh, the trace of the energy momentum tensor vanishes and then this term is actually zero. And uh, so we will be much more concerned with this um, shear viscosity here. 
So here, viscosity means, you know, what is the, if this is the wire and uh, particles move in this direction, what is the gradient of velocity if you go perpendicular to the movement of the fluid? So, and uh, so one of the essential basic applications of ADS-CFT, which made the whole field of applying ADS-CFT to strongly correlated materials was successful, is that um, the shear viscosity uh, can be calculated from the ADS-CFT correspondence. And uh, okay, so here are my two slides about ADS-CFT, but I think everybody's probably familiar with it just to the level um, that I'm going to show here. So we have quantum observables at the boundary of some curved space. Okay, uh, I should, although this is, uh, there's some random coordinates here, I should, this is a, a non, um, a non-compact space, okay. Um, so essentially uh, we have a boundary of a space and then here we have this hyperbolic behavior which is not really drawn here. But uh, the key point is that we can um, calculate quantum observables in this boundary theory from propagation in this classical theory in one dimension higher in this particular limit which really amounts to a subtle point approximation in, in a particular strong coupling fashion. Okay, and uh, the other fact which I need to mention about the ADS-CFT correspondence is um, we can easily introduce a finite temperature as we need if we want to describe a solid and also a finite density by putting a black hole into our anti visitor space. And then essentially what happens is that the Hawking temperature is identified with the temperature in the dual field theory. Okay, I assume that everybody has seen this before. And so now again, the causality structure of the black hole is very important to, for defining a retarded and advanced Green's function. So if this is a picture of a global anti sitter space with a black hole, um, so this is the radial coordinate. So this is the boundary of the anti sitter space. That's the radial coordinate and this is the so-called Endicke-Pinkelstein coordinates. Then uh, you can, um, draw the causal structure or the conformal diagram in, the, in this fashion. And so there's a future horizon and a past horizon. And uh, so the fluctuations um, dual to this operator O can be organized in two fashions, the one which come from the past and those will lead to the advanced Green's function and those going to the future, which will lead to the retarded Green's function for this operator O. And uh, so essentially the retarded Green's function, sorry, well, this, uh, can be calculated um, um, in the standard fashion from, from um, e evaluating the solution of the equation of motion for this field phi, subject to boundary conditions. And so for the retarded Green's functions, we impose a boundary condition here uh, at the future horizon, such that uh, matter can only fall into the black hole but not return back. Okay, so there will be a suppose, oh, sorry about this. Thing at the back, bottom, so there, there will be um, a so-called infalling boundary condition at the future horizon. Okay, so uh, this is a result which is very, very famous uh, in ads cfd correspondence. So um, the energy momentum tensor is dual to the, the graviton in ads cfd So um, for um, calculating uh, the shear viscosity, we need um, a Kuko formula. And actually the shear viscosity is uh, linked uh, or can be obtained from the retarded Green's function for the energy momentum tensor. And now the idea is to calculate this from the propagation through the uh, black hole space. And um, uh, that this then gives a particular result for this eta, which um, is actually shown here. It's a pretty simple result. So n is the rank of the gauge group of our theory, uh, the field theory, and t is the temperature. And uh, so um, the entropy density comes from the fact that we just evaluate the, the horizon area of the black hole, essentially. Uh, via the Bekenstein Hawking uh, formula, and then uh, the ratio of the two gives this very famous result 1 over 4 pi h bar over k Boltzmann. So, and 1 over 4 pi is 0 0.08. So, this is kind of the smallest number which you can get here. Um, so, and this is a result for a strong coupling behavior. Okay, so um, on the ADS side, um, this result is 
uh, obtained by solving the equation of motion for these graviton fluctuations. And uh, these equations of motion are obtained from the Einstein Hilbert action in this higher dimensional gravity space. Okay. Okay. Um, so now this is a result at infinite Toft coupling. So when the coupling lambda, which is g squared times n, goes to infinity. But if you want to compare to anything in condensed matter physics, um, then what we need is to look at finite corrections in, to this result in, um, in the inverse Toft coupling. So it will be an expansion about the strong coupling fixed point. So we do an expansion in the inverse coupling. And uh, to get these, um, so of course we can't do anything about the large n limit because we stay in the supergravity approximation to um, maybe a CFT, but um, we can look what happens if we um, uh, look at corrections in one over lambda. And this actually turns, uh, is equivalent to adding higher order curvature terms to this action here. Okay, I will come back to that. Um, now, the idea is, on one hand side, uh, using ADS-CFT, uh, we can calculate the corrections to the coupling. And then on the other side, we would like to propose a material which has a higher coupling than, um, or a stronger coupling than graphene. And then hopefully get to a regime where we can compare the two. That, that's the plan. And uh, so what we looked at were these so-called cargo mean materials. Uh, so Kagomi is a Japanese basket weaving pattern, which has this hexagonal structure, uh, as you can see here. And um, uh, one of these Kagomi materials with this hexagonal structure and the uh, Dirac uh, dispersion relation is this material Herbert Smithite. So it's named after some geologist called uh, Herbert Smith. And uh, this is the chemical composition. And you see it has a zinc uh, component here at the beginning. And yeah, so it, it definitely has this hexagonal structure as shown in this figure here. So it's rather small, but um, so uh, the greens uh, are the chlor chlorine. Uh, this is uh, zinc. I'm not sure why it's a gallium. So these are zinc. Uh, and uh, the blue is the copper, and red is oxygen, and uh, white is hydrogen. Okay. So this is a material which, is, uh, which exists. Okay, so there's a picture in Wikipedia for this material. Um, so now the idea of our condensed matter colleagues was, um, okay, so this original Herbert Smithite material that I just showed to you has these uh, double valued uh, zinc ions. And in this material, the Fermi surface is below the Dirac point. Okay, let me just go back to this figure, uh, which I showed before for graphene. Just to, uh, so um, if this is the band structure, then um, in this uh, zinc, in the standard Herbert Smithite, you also have such a band structure, but the Fermi surface is somewhere down here. Okay, so it's not really a Dirac material because for a Dirac material, you need our excitations to sit right at this point. And now the idea of our uh, colleagues in condensed matter is if we can uh, replace these uh, scanium atoms with Zinc, uh, zinc atoms with scandium atoms, which is uh, three times positive, then we would uh, shift the Fermi surface to lie directly at this um, Dirac point. So that's what the, they are proposing. And um, this is written. Uh, Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, Joanna, this is a prediction of probably some. Uh, um, lattice computations that you will shift the band Yes, function. exactly. So um, this is what I'm about to show. Um, so they, um, okay, Sorry, so this is a again question. a picture of, of what the material is going to look like. So these are the, the black uh, atoms used to be zinc and the idea is to replace this by scanium. And so this is probably what you are referring to. So that's what our colleagues in the condensed matter department did. Um, so they evaluated the band structure for this hypothetical material and also the phonon dispersion relation, um, which tells us that, um, so the, the point about this figure is that the lines go up quite a bit. So that if we are below 50 Kelvin, there shouldn't be too much uh, influence from the pho phonons on, on this um, structure of this material. So which is essential for having this hydrodynamic behavior. 
And okay, so the, the key point about this mantra, so this is a, a true calculation from the condensed matter colleagues with this uh, CRPA, I think, uh, well, CRPA they use for the coupling calculation here, I'm not quite sure. But it's, it's just under a bound structure calculation. And so the key point is that in this new material, you see the open and opening angle of this cone is much, so the gray one is the one for graphene. And now the opening angle becomes bigger. And this will mean that this effective coupling uh, also becomes um, stronger because th this is essentially the Fermi velocity here, the, the, the slope of this uh, linear behavior. And um, so then, um, okay, so maybe I should go back a long way to show you what happens. Yeah, here it was. Um, okay, you see the coupling is inversely proportional to the Fermi velocity. And so since here the opening angle is bigger, the Fermi velocity is smaller, and this means that this alpha will be bigger than in graphene. Uh, yeah, I hope this answers your question. Um, yes, okay. And, um, but, uh, okay, I, I should say, um, you know, I've given this talk to a really experimental condensed matter physicist, and they were rather skeptical that you could actually make this material in sufficient degree of purity. <laughs> but Can you enough, so once again, mm -hmm. I read the report yesterday. Yes. That in graphene, okay, in graphene, there yes. were some experimental group, I believe, in Europe. Yes. Were able to, I think, dope it with a lot of electrons. I suppose, whereby the the electrons became much more strongly correlated. Oh, okay. How interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, um, wh where did you read this? Mm. I read it in Physics Today report. Physics Today. Okay. I should take a look then. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I will take a look. Okay. So, just let me summarize what I just said. Um, so, so these uh, copper oxide plaquettes, they form this uh, hexagonal lattice, uh, cargo lattice. And um, so the low energy physics is coupled by these d orbitals at uh, each copper side. So that's uh, you know what the experimentalist, uh, sorry, the condensed matter theorist used to do this um, uh, structure calculation. And so the key point is that this material should have its Fermi level at, at the Dirac point. And this, uh, so there's a certain amount of orbital hybridization, and that allows for a larger Coulomb interaction. Uh, than in graphene. And so, so our prediction is that um, the coupling in this material should about be about 3 or 3.2, factor of 3 or 3.2 larger than in graphene. Uh, also, the optical phonons shouldn't destroy this um, hydrodynamic behavior. And okay, so for the hydrodynamic behavior, it's really important that the um, correlation length for the electrons uh, will just be a sixth of the value in graphene. And so then we suggested this material as being a candidate to test these universal projections from the ADS-CFT correspondence. Okay, so, um, you know, I've already been going for a long time. So I think what I want to say in the last five minutes is now uh, tell you a little bit about our gravity calculation. So the key point is that this uh, universal result, um, h bar over four pi k Boltzmann, um, so this holds at infinite coupling, and um, then we can, uh, for reasons I'm going to show to you in the next slide, um, the leading correction term will be in one over alpha to the three halves. So where this is effective coupling here. So in kinetic theory, we have this behavior, but this is only valid um, for very small values of the coupling. And um, so. Um, Okay, I'm going to show you that the structure of the correction that we need to look at looks like this. But, um, you know, there's of course a certain degree of uncertainty what this coefficient should be here. I mean, once we go away from the conformal large and um, large lambda limit, then of course it's, we have a lot less control of what's going on in the ads CFT correspondence than before. So um, that's why we allowed this coefficient to vary over a really, really, really big range of <laughs> So like this uh, for orders of magnitude to see what happens. Um, okay, so I mentioned to you that these uh, one over lambda corrections on the ADS side, um, they uh, will come from corrections of higher order in the curvature. So previously we were just looking at this Einstein-Hilbert term, 
And now we have something that R squared, R cubed, and R to the fourth. And um, okay, so first of all, since uh, this material is in two plus one dimensions, our gravity dual is in three plus one dimensions, so in four dimensions. And uh, so then um, this R squared term is essentially a, a topological term there, so it's lost by name. Term, so um, and, oh, yeah, there's other term at this order, but you can argue that they will not contribute. Um, so then um, there are no R cubed terms, um, so because they're absent in the type to be parent theories of this uh, low energy gravity action. And so the first term that really contributes is a term which is order R to the fourth, which actually comes from string theory. And this has this coefficient uh, um, of the top of coupling to the power of minus three halves. Um, of course, um, there's a lot of model dependence which we cannot capture in a simple ADS model. And we parameterize this by varying this coefficient uh, C, which you can see here. Okay, and then this is the result of the calculation. So this is the effective coupling, and this is the shear viscosity over entropy ratio. This uh, red dashed line is this uh, lower bound at infinite coupling, where it's one over four pi. Okay, so we, everything is in the unit of this number. And uh, so this black line is uh, what we get from kinetic theory, but this is only valid for values much below one the coupling. And now this blue band is the region that we get uh, from our expression here, varying the C over this range for four orders of magnitude. And it's rather interesting that although we vary C over four uh, orders of magnitude, um, you know, this eta over S only varies uh, in a range of you know, a factor of two or so, at least at larger values of the coupling. So this blue band is what you get from the gravity calculation. And now our condensed matter colleagues, uh, they calculated this effective coupling in graphene and in this uh, scandium substituted Herbert Smith And uh, um, the value of the coupling they find is about here. So it's about a factor three bigger than graphene. And um, most importantly, um, this is the reason where the error bar in, or the, in our prediction for eta over s is uh, considerably smaller. So we see that um, if it's possible to make such a material, then uh, it will be much more likely to uh, observe hydrodynamic effects here than uh, it is possible to have them in graphene. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, uh, and to conclude, what we also did is to actually evaluate the Reynolds number um, for this material. And uh, okay, um, so what we can actually claim that um, in this new material, um, the Reynolds number would be a factor 100 larger than in graphene. So there's even a chance that there might be some turbulent behavior formation of vortices or something like this um, happening there. Okay, so that uh, um, brings me to my conclusion. So I gave you two rather distinct talks. So the first was about this modular flow, um, where we, I gave some explicit expressions for modular flow of free fermion theories. And the key point was that um, the non-locality of these flows, which we already discussed <laughs> to some extent, uh, is explicitly realized. And um, so I think this is a nice basis for further analysis between the relation of entanglement and geometry. And then I gave you this overview um, over this uh, different project, which was a collaboration with my colleagues from the Connex Matter Department, uh, where we proposed the scandium substituted Herbert Smith um, um, to have an um, electron electron coupling, which is uh, about a factor 3.2 larger than in graphene. And so this may reach a region of um, uh, or robust uh, hydrodynamics in solids. And, then includes a smaller ratio of uh, eta over s in, in such that we reach the parameter region where we may use gauge gravity duality in um, its corrections. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say. I hope you still have uh, time for some questions and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Johanna. And the floor is open to questions. What's <laughs> normal? 
Yeah. Okay. Now. Well, so uh, thanks a lot. And um, I, I have a question uh, uh, for the, the RQ term. So in, in a way, you, you are parameterizing uh, hydrodynamics. And uh, I don't quite understand, uh, well, on, uh, on, uh, your way when you, when you, have, uh, you, you can suppress uh, the RQ term uh, where it's absent because of supersymmetry on, on one side. But is there something uh, corresponding, uh, some corresponding argument in, in condensed metaphysics uh, why uh, that, that term should be absent? Uh, that's a very interesting question. And I think well, the issue is that um, it's very hard to say anything about very strong coupling. And um, uh, I'm not, I mean, so here what we really say is that we, we go start from some fixed point or some, for some point where the coupling is really infinite, and then we make an expansion in one over this coupling. And so based on this argument uh, from the holography and ADSCFE correspondence and gravity, I can claim that the first term that contributes is uh, alpha to the three house. Okay. Now, uh, it's an excellent question to ask if, if we could uh, can draw the same conclusion with any other method. Now, this is where I'm not so familiar, and maybe this is a question to condensed matter physicists. Um, is it possible at all to make such a one over coupling expansion about uh, infinite coupling in some way? Um, and that's what one have, would have to do. And um, it's a very good question. And I'm, I'm not aware that somebody uh, uh, did anything like this, but you know, maybe somebody else has a comment. And, why would the infinite coupling be supersymmetric? I think was, was that was part of Bernard's. Well, the question was, um, you know, um, are there other reasons from condensed matter physics why uh, the leading behavior is one over alpha to the three halves? Yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, here in the gravity calculation, okay, maybe I shouldn't have written supergravity. I mean, it, um, here, of course. Um, in, in ADSCFT, we always start with something supersymmetric, and then we break the supersymmetry by adding extra fields or looking at the running of the coupling and so on. Um, and, and then, um, but I think this, the fact that these uh, terms are absent, this would still persist if we say we put a beta ton or so on, there's some running. So, so I think these arguments why only the R to the fourth term contributes is, uh, is rather robust um, at the level of, uh, of gravity, even if the supersymmetry is broken. <laughs> so there's also a bit of topology involved here, this goes by net. Um, um, but I mean, it's a very good question to ask, you know, let's not take ADS-CFT, let's take condensed matter physics. Is there any way of doing a strong coupling expansion of a similar type? Uh, I'm not aware, but uh, that would be interesting to check. Um, what is the status of eta over s equal to one over four pi? Is it checked in quark gluon plasma or? Yeah, in the quark gluon plasma, it's actually, um, they have pretty robust results by now. And um, yes, I mean, the, so the, the value observed in the quark gluon plasma is, I think, maybe 50% above this one over four pi. So uh, within experimental range, it's actually, it's very close. Yeah. Um, you know, I should say in the string community, there's a big debate how universal, I mean, you know, originally it was claimed that this is a universal quantity. But, um, you know, when including these higher order corrections um, may actually be that this bound is violated and even smaller values are possible. But for us, this would just be good. <laughs> Okay, uh, but um, um, nevertheless, um, the, the quark gluon plasma experimental result, I think this is the, the result where somebody, uh, a group, uh, collaboration really ex confirmed a prediction from ADS-CFT. Uh, the quark gluon plasma result is really very close to this uh, small number. And that's really striking because for water, hel liquid helium, it's really a factor of 100 or 1,000 this value. So, but I think in condensed matter physics, the situation is a lot less clear. I mean, there's quite a few experimental papers where people uh, have um, some result for, for hydrodynamics in graphene. 
uh, but there's still a lot of debate. Um, and uh, But what we are saying here is that if we had a material with a much stronger coupling, then uh, we have a much bigger chance of seeing these hydrodynamic effects than in graphene. And Domenico, you have a question? Uh, hi. So I, I have a similar question uh, because uh, usually in Dirac materials there are uh, uh, somehow quite precise uh, RG flow prediction of uh, how the normalization of the Fermi velocity. So yeah. I was wondering if you can compare your result from the holographic point of view to the more RG uh, calculations, uh, you know. Uh, in the DRA material, once yeah. you introduce interaction, you can uh, study, write some RG equations for uh, uh, and see how the Fermi velocity, yeah. you know, approach the fixed point or goes away or... Uh, the Fermi velocity or... Yeah, yeah, I was wondering, uh, you know, the normalization of the Fermi velocity yeah. interactions because it's something that uh, it happens in uh, the earth materials. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, that would enter this value of the coupling. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an, it's an excellent question. I, I would have to check with what people did. I mean, um, I mean, here it's pretty straightforward um, to get this behavior. And um, uh, at least my collaborators in Conesmata, um, I don't think they were aware of, aware of any calculation within Conesmata, which uh, gives a similar behavior. But, you know, um, as you first the question before also asked, I, I think that would be very interesting to see and compare if, if this can be obtained via some other means. And, uh, um, so do you have any particular references in mind? I mean, since we are talking about uh, There are this paper by Igor Erbut, uh, uh, who is ah, an yeah, yeah. Okay, yes, I, I, energy yes. flow for the Iraq material. So yeah. you know, he explored the different uh, uh, param the, uh, different parts of the parameter space where from, you know, from graphene you can reach the superconducting regime or mm -hmm. you can reach, uh, you know, the other kind of topological regimes or uh, so yeah, I was I was thinking about these papers in particular. Yes, um, um, well, I, I think I know uh, these papers. Okay, no, it's an you know I, I think nobody has looked at it. It's a very interesting suggestion, and uh, yeah, I will we'll certainly take a look. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm just making a note. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions? Maybe I, I was just the quantum corrections would be one of our end corrections. Is, I would expect. So uh, yes. Okay. So yeah, everyone has to be very careful. So there's a double expansion. Okay. So there's corrections in one over n, and there's corrections in one over lambda. Um, and it's, what is plays and, the role of n here? Yeah. In our approach, n is still infinite. <laughs> And we hide the fact that we don't know what n is in the condensed matter system by just dialing this. Uh, so we, I mean, we just absorb n into our unknown coefficient. Okay, so you're you're thinking that you can cover it by this that it would it would also be one of our alpha q to the three halves. Yes, exactly. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, you can check that the orders are such that you can just absorb this n into this uh, unknown coefficient. But okay. Um, you, you're asking a very important question. I mean, and this is something I think uh, which motivates to having a really closer look at. Com I mean, so there's this double expansion in one over n and one over lambda, and some of the terms appear in both. And, uh, and no, I mean, we check quite a lot of literature in ADS-CFT <laughs> and uh, hydrodynamics, but nobody was really disentangled uh, exactly how all these terms um, contribute at the different orders. And, um, and um, this is certainly something on our list of things to do. I mean, one thing is here that our system is in two plus one dimensions. Uh, in three plus one dimensions, then the story, of course, is different. Um, because then the, the gravity side is five dimensional. And um, yeah, OK. So I think the answer to your question is this is very important. And nobody has really looked at um, disentangling one over lambda and one over n corrections um, to a sufficient high order in the context of the ADS-CFT correspondence. But given this um, motivation, I think um, this is a very good reason to, 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 
to look at this in the end. Um, okay, this is something which I'm discussing with the PhD student now who's uh, on this project that, you know, <laughs> we, should, <laughs> we should do this extremely careful and disentangle all these terms to some order. So, yeah. Uh, Johanna, didn't, didn't uh, Hanada and collaborators had something in one dimension? Sorry, who was this? Hanada, Hanada, Matsu, 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 what's his first name? I mean, Hanada, you know, the, the Japanese name. Uh, Hanada. Yes. Uh, uh, and yeah. Ah, you mean and the graphics? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. They did some <laughs> double expansion. I looked at it. They did? Okay. In some of the papers. Okay, I wasn't aware. Be because they look at these quantum effects, right? They do all this stuff about uh, actually uh, okay. uh, using using uh, simulations to map this into quantum gravity. You know that that's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And they have a paper. They have some papers from 2013 or something. Oh, okay, no, I wasn't aware. Uh, it's a very useful expansion because everything is there. But I don't know they what they, they don't do everything clearly, but. Uh, I think Hashimoto was was that was no, it's, not, they, um, it's another reference that. Uh, well, it's these Japanese guys. They in that line of work. Uh, they also have a science paper. They didn't make it to Nature, I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, and th that's very good to know because I mean, there's this review by Sierra Cremonini, and then there's some paper about higher order corrections by Rob Myers from some years ago. So we looked at those, but. Well, it's a one-dimensional version of the ADC, so you, you can solve it with uh, matrix models. Maybe that's. I right. feel that's the reason. Yeah. Okay. But uh, okay, okay. Yeah, and it's type uh, QA, I think, and uh, and yeah. Then, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, I will take a look. Thanks for suggesting that. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do thanks for the question. Okay. Do we have other questions? Maybe on the perhaps even on the first part of the talk, where we finish with the discussion on the modular uh, Hamiltonian. Did someone want to come back to that? Well, if if not, let's thank uh, Johanna again for making an extreme effort to cover the diversity of our of our audience by. <laughs> condensed matter with uh, with uh, modular Hamiltonians and abstract mathematics. Yeah, thanks. I hope it was useful for most of the people in some way. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, Joanna. I will stop the recording and we can be okay, informal. <laughs>